Welcome to the latest in our Get Data Protection Fit series, where we will be focusing on how to complete a data breach register. Hello, my name is Martin McElroy, and I'm a Senior Data Protection Advisor in Field Fisher's data team, part of the Technology and Data team. I'm also Field Fisher's Data Protection Officer, and I'm joined today by Sophia Steiger, who is a fourth seat trainee solicitor also in the data team. So thank you for joining us today for the latest in our Get Data Protection Fit series. We are now into the third year of this series and all previous videos can be found on the Field Fisher Data Team's YouTube channel. This third series has focused on a range of GDPR accountability measures. And this particular video is the latest and last in a mini series focusing on data breaches. And in this video, we will be explaining how to complete your data breach register. We highly recommend watching parts one and two of the data breach series to understand whether you need to notify a data breach and if so, how to make this notification to a regulator like the ICO. And as said, these two videos together with the others in the 2022 series can all be found on the Field Fisher Data Team YouTube channel. And so by the end of this session, we hope that you will understand why a data breach register is an essential part of data protection, where this accountability obligation comes from, before finally knowing how to complete your data breach register using a mock incident as an example. Please note that in this video, we will be referring to a data breach or data breach register, but it's possible that you may also know these or refer to these registers as incident registers or data incident registers. And for the purposes of this video, please assume that these terms are interchangeable. Let's recap quickly. What is a personal data breach? The GDPR describes it as a breach of security leading to the accidental or unlawful destruction, loss, alteration, unauthorised disclosure of or access to personal data transmitted, stored or otherwise processed. In summary, it is a security incident that has affected the confidentiality, integrity or availability of personal data. There can be serious consequences to a personal data breach, from reputational damage and loss of trust, to loss of business, disciplinary action and even fines of up to 10 million euros or 2% of your global turnover if you fail to notify. So should you notify the relevant data protection authority of the breach? This depends on the risk to the data subjects, whether it's no risk, risk or high risk. If a personal data breach is likely to be a risk to people's rights and freedoms, you must notify the ICO. If you decide you do not need to report the breach, justify and document this decision. This issue is explored in depth in our previous videos and the ICO offers helpful examples of personal data breach and what are the responsible actions to take. So regardless of whether we have to notify the relevant DPA, why do we need to complete a data breach register? The answer is simple, it is a legal obligation. Here we will briefly touch on the Privacy and Electronic Communications Regulations, or PECA, which sits alongside the Data Protection Act and the UK GDPR to give people specific privacy rights in relation to electronic communications. At Regulation 5A8, PECA includes the obligation to maintain an inventory of personal data breaches and the ICO requests that these are securely submitted monthly. The ICO website has produced a PECA template log to assist in recording this information. There are similar reporting obligations under other legislation, such as the NICE Directive. In this session, we will be focusing on the UK GDPR, which states at Article 33.5 that the controller shall document any personal data breaches comprising the facts relating to the personal data breach, its effects and the remedial action taken. That documentation shall enable the Commissioner to verify compliance with this article. Accountability is a key principle in data protection law and keeping an up-to-date and accurate personal data breach register demonstrates that you comply with the relevant legislation as well as showing that you are managing personal data risks by being aware of them and their consequences, together with considering the best practice in terms of remedial action. Having a well-run data breach register shows the high standards you set for privacy. 
it ensures that near misses are recorded, response plans are carried out, and demonstrates understanding amongst your business of the need to report data breaches as well as their effective management. As part of the ICO's accountability framework, they require you to have procedures in place to make sure that you detect, manage, and appropriately record personal data incidents and breaches, even if these are low risk and do not need to be reported to the ICO or the individual data subject. A data breach register is an essential part of this procedure and a crucial tool in recording incidents that do or may impact personal data. So let's talk through what a simple data breach register looks like. But before we do, we would like to quickly mention that Field Fisher has a data breach register template available for purchase, which includes greater detail of, of information that is worth recording. Please reach out to us or our team if you'd like to discuss purchasing this document. We are now going to break down the register across the next few slides and use an example from the ICO website as our example breach. It's important to reiterate here that this central log should record near misses as well as actual breaches, regardless of whether or not they need to be reported to a regulator like the ICO. The ICO specifies that a data breach log must document the facts relating to the near miss or breach, including its causes, what happened, the personal data affected, the effects of the breach, and any remedial action taken and, and the rationale behind that. You can, of course, include more information, but these are the essentials to include. We are looking at this breach from the perspective of the controller. And before we begin to look at completing the register, let's take a moment to consider the format of the, of the register itself. Now, some of you may be using bespoke privacy tech platforms such as OneTrust, or perhaps you use an IT service desk tool to capture information relating to data breaches. Some of you may be using Excel spreadsheets or even tables within Word documents to record your breach information. There is no right or wrong way or right or wrong format within which to collect and record your breach information. The key is that your data fields reflect the requirements of the ICO or the regulator within your jurisdiction, that the register is secure, and that someone or a team is responsible for ensuring the data breach register is maintained and up to date. So looking at the register itself, let's consider some basic housekeeping adding number, adding references, adding the date and time of the breach. So far, so simple. Secondly, let's look at the cause of the breach. Why was there a breach? And in our example, an employee fell victim to a phishing scheme and entered their details into a malicious website. Their email address then became compromised and the employee's emails were diverted to a third party. So now that we've captured the basic information surrounding the breach, for example, the date, the time, an outline of what occurred, and also given the incident a reference number, let's add a bit more flavor and detail to the effect data and how we became aware of the breach in the first place. So in this slide, we've broken the table down into a further four sections. Firstly, how many people have been affected? In this scenario, let's say it, is, it has affected nine people a mixture of the employee and multiple clients. Next, how many records were affected? In this scenario, we have given 27 as a ballpark example. The ICO has defined a singular record as being, it could be a missing document, a notebook, an electronic device, or an email. An email could have been issued to 20 individuals. This, could, this would therefore be classed as 20 records for a single email. So when assessing the number of records, it's important to consider the nature of the incident and how many records may have been accessible to third parties. In some cases, this could be a duplication of the same record. And so for a single email or electronic document with wide circulation, this could result in multiple records being generated for that single document. Consider also the nature of the breach. So this was an example of, of an electronic nature rather than a physical document breach. 
and it led to unauthorized access uh, of personal data. In other scenarios, the breach may have led to the destruction of the data, general loss of it, alteration or unauthorized disclosure. It's helpful to have a consistent classification scheme and description for the nature of the breaches your organization deals with. It's helpful because it will keep reporting consistent and it will also help show your management and potentially your data protection officer trends and themes over time. And this can be useful when it comes to making decisions about further investment, say, in dealing with phishing attacks. Finally, on this slide, it's also useful to record how you became aware of the breach to explain uh, and to explain the timeline. And this can be used as a guide um, to show others on how to notice breaches in the future. In addition, again, to being useful information in your register in the first place. And so continuing on with the gathering of the facts surrounding this breach, we now note the types of personal data that have been affected as a result of the breach on the register. This is an opportunity for you to describe everything that's relevant. So, for example, in our instant, the malicious third party responded to client emails using a spoofed email account, advising them of a change of bank details. This resulted in two clients making significant payments to the third party rather than to the data controller. It was also discovered that the affected email account contained scanned copies of client ID documents. And as far as the personal data types that have been affected go, this means that we're looking at a mixture of basic contact information, financial data and identity documents. Note that in this example, no special category data was impacted in the incident, but this is the field and the opportunity to describe and to call out the types of special category data that might be impacted in the breach you're dealing with. And this may also have a bearing on your decision to notify a regulator or not. We have also included a field showing the date and time when the business became aware of the data breach. Note, this is not the time when the information security, response team, or any other relevant person within your compliance groups became aware of the incident, but it's the first time when anyone within the business became aware. This is relevant as this detail may be needed in the event that you decide to notify supervisory authority, but it's also needed in the, you know, to help you determine the 72 hour window in which to make that notification. Next on our register, we want to look at and record the effects of the breach. In other words, we want to summarize what consequences happened as a result of the personal data breach. And here, in this case, we know that in addition to email security being compromised, multiple clients received emails from a spoofed email account, advising them of a change of bank details. This led to two clients making significant payments to the third party rather than to the data controller. In addition, the affected email account had scanned copies of client ID documents, so these were now exposed to the third party too. We then move on to the next section, which covers remedial actions taken by your organization in response to the data breach and the rationale behind any decisions in summary form. This is an opportunity to assess the level of risk that you judge the breach to be at and why. And after making any decisions about the level of risk, how did you respond to the breach or near miss? This section of your register gives an opportunity to include justifications for your action and the reasoning behind it. This is essential if you decide the breach does not need to be reported or notified. In our example here, the data controller identified this breach as very high risk and therefore informed the ICO within 72 hours, as well as letting the impacted clients know as they, were, as they deemed there to be a sufficient risk of harms to their rights and freedoms, particularly as a result of the fraudulent financial payments. As well as the obligations to report and notify the breach, this section allows you to note what actions you took as a company to immediately halt the incident and to prevent the contagion spreading further. In this case, this was done by a combination of immediate technical steps to isolate the affected account, reset it, as well as other wider organizational efforts to make people aware of the attack and for people to be on alert. This field within your data breach register gives you the opportunity to summarize these steps and others which could include, for example, a global password reset 
in the event of multiple accounts being compromised, the restoration of systems from backup in the event of a, of a serious cyber attack, or if wider training and communications are needed in the aftermath of a series of phishing attacks. All of these steps should be neatly captured and summarized within this section. Moving on to the final sections of our mock data breach register, and here we include fields for any lessons learnt and the date the incident gets closed. The lessons learnt field is not strictly required to be part of the register. However, we know from the ICO accountability framework, for example, that regulators expect organisations to analyse all data, personal data breach reports to prevent a recurrence. And so we've seen a number of clients incorporate this into their breach register as a convenient way of recording steps taken to prevent the incident happening again, which we think shows the usefulness of the breach register as an accountability tool, but also as a vehicle to document internal strategy and process. It also demonstrates a positive approach to data protection and that you as an organisation are responsive and proactively manage personal data risks. In this scenario, the lessons learned center on the implementation of multi-factor authentication or MFA, the strengthening of awareness around phishing and phishing attacks and the need for further communications and training on this, the need to review gateway security with IT and IT security teams, and that's to try and prevent or block phishing or impersonation impersonation emails from entering your network in the first place, the importance of secure storage of confidential data, such as the uh, IDs that were discovered as part of this attack, and the regular review of phishing attacks and trends over time. Finally, your register should include the date on which the data breach was closed. Now, how you measure Closure could be subject to debate and may warrant a training video in its own right. But in this case, we have looked at it as being completed as both the immediate threat has been contained and the implementation of those remediation actions listed, such as MFA, are now in place. And there we have it. Our data breach register is completed and all the information is on hand for future reference. We now understand that a data breach register is essential to meet our accountability requirements and is part of an effective data protection policy. We know how to complete a template data breach register and where to look for alternative templates. If you are interested in learning more about data and privacy, we have a rich bank of resources on our YouTube channel. These range from modular training programs for lawyers and privacy professionals to recordings of individual webinars and other mini-series delivered by our team. To join our YouTube channel, just follow the link that is on screen and that will take you through to our data team page. We also have an email update which is available through the second link and can be received daily, weekly or monthly. We hope you found this session useful. Do get in contact if you have any queries or comments. Thank you for watching. Goodbye.